in the United States, at least for the majority of the states, we have what is called a closed shop. So there is one union at a workplace, and that the dues for the union are taken out of the check that the worker receives before the worker receives it, and it is given to the union. This was won basically during World War II, and it shows how there could have been a bureaucratization very early in the US union movement through this mechanism of the closed shop. But the right wing chose to attack the closed shop with what is called the open shop, that you have the right to belong to the union or not, and that there will be no dues taken out of your paycheck. That is something the union movement will have to do on its own. So this, these, the open shop took place primarily in the South. But in the last few years, it has come to the North. It has come to Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, the industrial heartland, and my, my city is Detroit, Michigan, so we also are now an open shop state. So how is the restructuring of the workplace taking place? Through automation, lean production, team concept, globalized production, just-in-time delivery. I'm sure you have heard of these concepts here in Germany, right? Yeah. So with all of this restructuring, the union officials were not able to rebuild a militant union. Instead, they said, workers must accept concessionary bargaining in order to keep the company profitable, and eventually we would win back what we were giving up when there were better days. Over the last 20 years, the UAW has failed to organize even one assembly plant. You probably know about the Volkswagen vote, which happened two and a half years ago, in which the UAW lost only by one or one and a half percent, but it lost even though the company tried to be neutral and the workers' council from Germany tried to help the UAW in the organizing drive. At the beginning of this month, August, the, there was a vote at the Nissan plant after a 12-year campaign, and the UAW lost the vote by 62%. I think there are a couple of obvious reasons why we lost. Number one, Nissan had a very aggressive anti-union campaign. They had meetings, in-plant meetings, they had one-to-one -one conversations. They had videos circulating in the break room. They really saturated the place. Even the governor of the state was against uh, the union. But the UAW didn't expect such an anti-union campaign, so they were broadsided. But that's not the only mistake they made. In the plant, there are 2,500 temporary workers who work not for Nissan, that's not their employer, but for Kelly Services. And the UAW didn't bother to organize them because they don't work for Nissan. And yet they were the ones most in need of help. In my opinion, what the UAW should have done instead of propaganda, propagandizing for a union is to act like a union and to include everybody in that union by on-the-floor campaigns. If there was a health and safety problem, 
they should be marching on their break to management. In fact, the in-plant committee that was organizing couldn't take any initiative. All initiatives had to come from the officials. You can't win a union without innovative tactics on the shop floor. And the teachers in America are very important because 60% of them are still in unions. In the private sector, only 7% of the workers are in unions today. They've totally wiped out, practically totally wiped out the uh, private sector. But in the public sector, teachers are very well organized and that's where the right wing attack is coming. So teachers have contracts. Those contracts include their pensions, seniority, tenure. But most people, most working people in America don't have those, those kinds of conditions. And so the right wing attacks the teachers saying, these are privileged people. They have conditions you don't have, implying that they should be taken away from the teachers to make people feel resentment towards the teachers. No one should have more than the least. So the second point I want to mention about the attacks on the teachers is they have invented something called charter schools, which directly compete with public schools. They get the same amount of per pupil money that the public schools get. Plus, they can exclude people from the schools that they don't like. If they, don't, they can't bother with special education children, they don't have them. If any child has a problem with discipline, they throw them out. And in addition, the right-wing foundations give much money to these charter schools. Bill and Melissa Gates, the Broad Foundation, uh, the DeVos family, and others give millions of dollars to these charter schools to be able to compete with the public schools. In Detroit, for example, there are 100,000 children. Only 46,000 go to public schools. The rest go to charter schools or religious schools or schools in other cities. So what I'm trying to point out is that the restructuring and the attack on unions and our social institutions predate Trump. In fact, I can say that each president, whether they were Democratic or Republican, at least from Jim, Jimmy Carter on, has moved the spectrum further and further to the right. So one of the things that uh, Trump has done is put people in charge of agencies who actually oppose those agencies. So for example, the person who is the Secretary of Education is Betsy DeVos, who worked hard in the state of Michigan to make sure that not only were charter schools set up, but that there were no regulations against them. So the people in charge of the Department of Health are people who not only oppose abortion, they actually oppose birth control. Scott Pruitt is in charge of the, he's the director of the Environmental Protection Agency, an agency that he sued many times because he does not believe in protecting the environment. So I think you get the idea of who's in charge. They're all wealthy and they all oppose the agencies that they've been in put, put in charge of. In fact, you could say if there's one thing that the Trump administration wants to ensure is that there are greater tax cuts for the wealthy. During the first six months of the Trump administration, labor has not always been in the forefront, but labor has been very active around opposing the Nazis and did come out in both Boston and the Bay Area uh, against the Nazis, and this is an important development. I read in the, uh, on the, online this morning that the president of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trump, said he just didn't feel that the union movement 
could work with President Trump. And I'm glad to see that because in the past, uh, the AFL-CIO has put out uh, statements with which I profoundly disagreed, particularly the one around uh, Standing, Standing Rock and the Dakota Access Pipeline. So labor has a great deal of work to do. One of the most important things, I think, is that we have to be part of the environmental movement. I belong to a group called Labor Network for Sustainability. And what we try to talk about is that workers should not be punished in the transition from fossil fuels to a sustainable economy. And it's easy enough to do that because we have to make the corporations and the government pay. It's possible to, for example, take an auto plant like the one I worked in, and in the United States we have no mass transit, so to build buses and trains, but also build things like wind turbines. So there is work, there is much work to be done, and we have to convince people who are afraid that they will be lost if there is uh, in this movement towards sustainability, that they have a place and we will defend them. So on the question of work time, it is a very difficult question. But it seems to me that the most important thing is to have political discussions in the workplace and in your union, in your locals, why it is wrong for there to be uh, rushing people uh, at the one point or making people work long hours while laying off others. This is not a solution that we should accept. So let's imagine that we were running the plant. What would we do in the circumstance? And it seems to me that in that kind of a discussion, somebody wouldn't be sitting around for three hours. They'd be doing something else that was productive whether it was planning or whatever. Uh, you wouldn't be laying off other people. Uh, you might be educating them. You might be reducing the work week. But how could we begin to implement this at the workplace? Next to the strike, our most powerful tool is work to rule. It's impossible to carry out work to rule in a plant unless everybody knows and everybody agrees to participate because you are working but not producing. So you are working the plant backwards and you have to do it in a coordinated way and you have to do it so that you're protecting each other. So you have to begin with political discussions at your workplace and in your union and it's difficult. I know in the United States it's very hard because people want to work more than 40 hours. They want to be paid extra because there's always money on the floor that they will want to pick up. And convincing people to work together to uh, save jobs I think can be done, but it can only be done if it's in a campaign way. And so maybe you should study how this has happened in other places. In the United States, it was a, a movement that was cut short, but it happened in the 1980s in auto. Uh, Jerry Tucker, who was a leader of New Directions, wa uh, really led that campaign. But I understand that the nurses here are doing something similar, always having to wash their hands, really following what work to rule is and how that slows everything down. But again, you must, everyone has to participate and the union officials have to be convinced of it as well. So it's, it, it really has to be a campaign. On NAFTA, the, uh, I think the union thought that they could negotiate with Trump, but now they're getting the idea that this is not such a good idea. And the fact that the AFL-CIO director said this morning, 
we don't think we can work with Trump is a good sign to me because nothing will, good will come from NAFTA. It will get worse, not better. I belong to a small rank and file auto caucus, uh, and we put out a leaflet against Buy America because the majority of auto workers, and probably a majority of workers, believe we should buy America. And we put out ours as a, as a beginning a propaganda piece to say, buy union, that's the alternative. Are there other forms of organizing that we should be promoting uh, as opposed to the bureaucratic unions that we're stuck with? I think if we can do it, great. But I believe that we'll also have to transform our own bureaucratic unions. In fact, there has been for, uh, I don't know, at least a decade, a new form of organizing called worker centers. and. Uh, that is a good form, especially for uh, undocumented workers who are not getting paid for their work. A lot of good work can be done by that, but it really doesn't replace the union. So in a way, I like the example of the teachers union in Chicago that began as a reading group and ended up as the new leadership of the union. So how did they do it? Number one, they were democratic, and that's key. Number two, they decided that when parents wanted to prevent a school from being closed or had some other issue, they would go and support the parents. And the point that they made was that their working conditions are the children's living and, and learning conditions. Uh, the mayor of Chicago is a man named Rob Emanuel, who used to be uh, President uh, Obama's uh, chief of staff. And he, is, he came from Wall Street. So now he is the mayor of Chicago. And he prefers to give money uh, to uh, developers and to the Chicago stock market and likes to uh, uh, stiff the uh, schools, in fact, under his administration, over 50 schools were closed. And his children go to a wonderful university center where they have music and art and wonderful programs. And the teachers say, that is what all schools should be like. That's what all public schools should be like. We want what, Ma what Rob Emanuel's children have. So even the president of their union, Karen Lewis, she decided to run against Rob Emanuel and was ahead in the polls. Unfortunately, she had brain cancer and had to step out of the race. But this shows the aggressiveness of the teachers' union. So uh, the three largest uh, teachers' unions in the country Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, it is um, uh, reformers who control two of those unions. But they are not just uh, working in their own uh, cities. They realize they have to build a national caucus with the teachers in other uh, unions. And they have a, a conference calls and a yearly get together. So although the, the teachers union in Chicago certainly has its problems, what I think it does is it, it sees the workplace as the world and it tries to organize appropriately and it seems to me that's a good idea. <laughs>